Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Sebecki with the Need More Fund, and I'm coming you to you today from my office in Harrisburg, Ohio. And on behalf of the NFG board, I am pleased to welcome all of you to today's convening. I was honored about a year ago or so when I was asked, along with Shona Chakravati, to serve as the co-chairs for this year's convening in Washington, D.C., which, of course, quickly became the conference that would not be. Thanks, COVID. But I am so pleased and proud of the way in which our nimble staff pivoted to organize our first virtual convening. Beginning in June, we have offered a number of the sessions that were originally planned for the in-person event. And we have more coming your way in the months of November and December. So please be sure to check out the NFG website to get more information about these upcoming events. I was also pleased to be asked to host today's session regarding the paradox that exists in philanthropy given its close ties to capitalism. I've been in philanthropy about 30 years and I'm gonna say somewhere around year 10, there was this little voice inside of me that was starting to wonder, gee, could philanthropy be part of the problem? Well, again, we have organized a stellar panel that will explore ways in which we can ensure that philanthropy is operating in ways that are equitable, just, and democratic. So again, I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation. Um, of course, we are doing this via Zoom. So I'm going to remind everybody to be on their best Zoom behavior. I was told I could not make any Jeffrey Tubin references, but let's just say uh, no multitasking on today's call, please. And with that, I am pleased to turn it over to NFG's new Vice President of Programs, Farhan McClurkin. Farhan, take it away. Thank you so much, Mary. I uh, am also super excited to be here. Um, this is such an amazing uh, conference and uh, this panel in particular is one that I'm very excited to learn from our panelists. And so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, our esteemed panelists. First, I want to introduce Anna Connor, um, who is the co-director of the Third Wave Fund, which is an activist fund led by and for women of color, intersex, queer, and trans folks under the age of 35 in the U.S. Third Wave Fund works to ensure that young folks are decision makers at the cutting edge of philanthropy, where they are most commonly absent. Before Third Wave Fund, they were at Borealis Philanthropy, supporting the Transforming Movements Fund and Black-led Movement Fund, and Estrella Lesbian Foundation for Justice working on the development team. Anna came to this work through organizing with Fierce where they converted queer and trans youth of color across the US to talk about gentrification, policing and how young people are building a movement to end violence. They became passionate about resourcing organizations and movements that are most impacted by oppression while participating in Miss Mary J. Tool circle, I'm sorry, Miss Major J. Tool Giving Circle's participatory grant making process. Sorry, that was a mouthful. Um, our second panelist is uh, Kaberi Banerjee Murphy. Kaberi is Director of Program Strategy at Meyer Memorial Trust. Established in 1982, Meyer has awarded roughly 790 million in grants and program related investments to more than 3,380 organizations in Oregon and Southwest Washington. As Meyer's Director of Program Strategy, she's responsible for fostering organization-wide collaboration while developing and implementing programmatic strategies that reinforce Meyer's four portfolios and help leverage underlying intersections among them. Kaberi brings to Meyer more than 20 years of philanthropic experience in youth, immigration, social justice, education, arts, civic affairs, health, and community development at local, regional, and national levels. Before working at Meyer Memorial Trust, Kaberi served as the Vice President of Programs at the Brooklyn Community Foundation in New York, Program Director for Education, Civil Affairs, Arts, and Culture at the Crown Family Philanthropies in Chicago, Education Program Officer for Jane's Trust, and the Jesse B. Cox Charitable Trust in Boston. We're also honored to have uh, Katie Love, Katie was formerly director of the grant-making team at the Wikimedia Foundation. 
the nonprofit that runs Wikipedia. She began her career in philanthropy at the Global Fund for Children, managing grants to grassroots NGOs, and then since then has developed, facilitated, or volunteered in many community-led grant-making activities. She has also led and participated in approximately 30 local and national U.S. participatory grant-making processes. She's deeply inspired by the model of the disability rights movement, nothing about us, nothing without us. Beyond participatory philanthropy, Katie has worked with Emergency Cap Capacity Building Project, a collaboration between six of the largest NGOs working to improve humanitarian response and increase NGO accountability. Katie serves on the steering committee of the Human Rights Funders Network, where she helped to develop the Grant Craft Guide on Participatory Grant Making and a community of practice. She's also on the board of directors of a school in the Bay Area where she lives with her family. And last, but certainly not least, we have Alistair Malillan, Senior Program Officer at Common Council Foundation. As Senior Program Officer, Alistair directs philanthropic services for Common Council's clients, supports donors in aligning their philanthropic practices with social justice grant making, and bridges relationships in the philanthropic field. He previously served as membership and communications manager for Justice Funders based in Oakland, California. Before relocating to Oakland in 2016, Alistair was executive director for Asian American Resource Workshop, which activated Asian American communities to participate in social change efforts. He also served as associate director of programs and services at Philanthropy Massachusetts, coordinating affinity groups for funders and directing capacity building programs and initiatives for nonprofit organizations. Alistair has a decade of experience in the philanthropic and nonprofit field, serving in grant making roles for Haymarket People's Fund, New England Foundation for the Arts, Saffron Circle, Saffron Circle's Giving Circle, Access Strategy Funds, and Funding Exchange. Alistair is active in his community, serving as vice chair of the board for Asian Pacific Environmental Network, also known as APEN. Uh, is a board member for Filipino Advocates for Justice and is participating in a working group in the local resource generation chapter. He also serves uh, on the local engagement chapter of Exponent Philanthropy and is co-chair of the Integrated Rural Strategies Group at Neighborhood Funders Group. So we have an amazing panel that is bringing decades of experience in the philanthropic sector. And I'm so happy to um, pass to um, Alistair and Anna who are going to sort of give us some framing for this panel. Thanks, Farhan, and welcome into this conversation, everybody. Uh, before engaging with our speakers, Anna and I just first want to offer up some context and framing for how to think about this session. I imagine that a lot of folks uh, may have joined because at some level they are drawn to or at least familiar with the critiques and analysis of philanthropy put forward by folks like Edgar Villanueva, Anand Girdas, and others. So as a Cliff Notes version for those who may not be familiar, the takeaway is that there's an understanding that philanthropy uh, often exists because of and to perpetuate a capitalist system. This effectively continues a charity model that strengthens the status quo and existing power structures. Next slide. Uh, so on the one hand, donors and philanthropic staff today have more financial resources that it any other point in history. And on the other hand, there's an interest in social justice and social change from the part of philanthropy. So the question within a capitalist system and framework is how can we act in more values alignment and shift meaningful power into the hands of impacted people? Next slide. And we say this because within the philanthropic system and within the capitalist system writ large, money often equates to power. While there have been some successful efforts to move impacted communities into decision-making seats, by and large, those who are impacted by funding dollars are often on the outside looking in when decisions are being made. So then that brings us to the crux of this session 
Um, in this session, we are, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> crux of this session. Are there ways to change who is in charge of making decisions on where money goes? The short answer is yes, there are. In this session, we're particularly going to explore participatory grant making as one answer to shifting power and values alignment within philanthropy. So I'll turn it over to Anna to share a bit more on this. Awesome, thank you so much, Alistair. Um, for that framing. And yes, so for this conversation, we're using the definition named in the Grant Craft Participatory Grant Making Manual called Deciding Together Shifting Power and Resources Through Participatory Grant Making. And so that definition is participatory grant making is an approach to philanthropy that seeds decision making power about funding to the very communities that funders aim to serve. That includes seeding the decision-making power over the strategy and criteria behind those decisions. Next slide, please. And so I hope you've gathered from this very brief framing that not all participatory grant-making is created equal. So for example, um, you know, having a group of private funders decide what grants to make around a conference table is quote unquote participatory, right? Um, but that's not what we mean on this panel today by participatory grant making. So by our definition, participatory grant making needs to focus on centering, uplifting, and listening to the leadership of communities that are closest to the issues. It needs to build off of the trust, knowledge, and wisdom of folks who have the lived experiences of addressing issues on the ground. And this is because we know that people who are closest to the issues uh, or closest to the challenge are the best position to address it. And I just really wanna emphasize that last point. Um, you know, as social justice funders, participatory grant making is a critical strategic and mission aligned shift to make because it means that you're centering the leadership and decision-making power of communities most impacted by oppression and best positioned to address and fund what their communities need. Um, so yeah, so thank you all for listening to this brief framing. Um, so in the rest of this conversation, we will discuss how institutions can enter into participatory grant making. Um, what the impact has been so far and dive into how you can enter the PG conversation at any institution um, and think about actual challenges to implementing participatory grant making. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that you ended that with this question of how do we enter the conversation around participatory grant making. And so I just thought um, it might be useful to have some of our panelists actually speak to how they entered the conversation on participatory grant making. And so I thought I would um, actually start with Katie. Um, Katie, can you just share a little bit of your background and how you got involved with this, got to know this, uh, this form of grant making? Yes, I would love to. I actually think that I trace my interest in this to learning about participatory budgeting, which I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with, a deeply inspiring way of making decisions about a city's budget or a government's budget through citizens themselves. And for me, that was one of the deep-seated reasons that I went into this field. I actually began my work in philanthropy at an amazing organization called the Global Fund for Children that makes grants to grassroots organizations working with children. And as I learned about my role there and learned from the wisdom of my peers and advisors and did the best I could as a program officer, I felt increasingly uncomfortable with some of the power that I had. Why was I entitled to make decisions about money that wasn't mine to begin with and actually didn't impact me in the end? I did the best I could. I really tried to, to lead with my values. But ultimately, I was drawn towards many community philanthropy initiatives. I co-founded a giving circle, worked at community initiatives uh, where I was living at the time, and began to explore this phenomenon 
that is actually decades old. Several folks on the call I know have experience with participatory grant making from uh, funding exchange members, for instance. And so I actually began to move to philanthropy that was exclusively participatory grant making. I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikipedia, and all of the grant making there is done participatorily. <laughs> In fact, just as Wikipedia is created by everyone for everyone, that was the natural way of the grant making programs led with accountability, participation, transparency, learning. Those were the values that guided us in the grant making. And now I've turned to work in the sector at large to help bring other folks onto the same page about this. Thank you. And I wanted to um, actually ask the same question to Kaberi. How did you start to learn about this and get involved with participatory grant making. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so excited to be here to talk about this. It's one of my favorite topics and um, there's no better group to be in conversation with than, um, than the folks here with me. So I started um, really, I really started with participatory per, in a personal space. And so I was part of a number of giving circles. Um, I originally uh, was one of the members of the Asian, uh, the Asian giving circle in Chicago had moved to uh, Boston and helped start the Saffron Circle, which, which was an intergenerational giving circle. And then when I moved to New York, joined the Asian Women's Giving Circle. And all of the, in all of these times and all of these spaces, even though I was doing that personally, I was a program officer or in um, working within mainstream philanthropy. And I could always sense the disconnect between the passion and the understanding of how deeply um, how deep the commitment was to the grant making when folks who understood the nuances of the challenges were involved in some of that decision making and how different that felt from the spaces that I had sort of had my professional hat on um, to be able to do the analysis and bring the recommendations to a board. And so um, as I moved in on and in philanthropy, um, I ended up at the Brooklyn Community Foundation where there was already a deep commitment to participatory practices and was really able to be able to lean into that space and grow our programming in that area. Um, by the time I left, about half of our grant making had moved from um, were, were considered participatory practices, some of them centering young folk, some of them centering communities and neighborhoods um, that were particularly important to us. Um, and so it was an opportunity to really be able to meld those streams together of um, the beauty of what I'd experienced personally and bringing in, able to, being able to bring it into a professional context. Um, and now I'm at the Meyer Memorial Trust here in Portland, Oregon, and one of the um, challenges and opportunities here is to be able to determine and create path pathways to be able to bring that type of participatory practice to a grant making institution 10 times the size of the one that I was before. And so that's really about um, making it as authentic experience as possible, um, slowing down the process to make sure that we know that we do not have the answers, co-creating it with community and making sure that we're moving at the speed of trust, especially as we think about building these um, spaces within BIPOC communities. And so um, at Meyer, we're sort of early in our journey and part of the, the, the lens and the frame that I hope to be able to bring today is what it looks like to be able to bring these types of ways of working to larger institutions. Thanks, Baran. Thank you, Kaberi. And uh, it's really, I'm, I'm happy that you shared where you're at in your journey, because one of the things we want to emphasize in this is that uh, this is a process, a learning process, and a process that we're hoping that uh, this panel can help people identify where they're at on, um, as opposed to be purely prescriptive, um, because we know we're in different situations, different institutions, and at different places in it. So I um, wanted to ask the same question again to Anna. Can you tell us and share a little bit about your journey? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. Um, so I got into participatory grant making through a giving circle that was amazing. Let me tell you all about it. Um, so I was a part of the Miss Major J Tool Giving Circle, uh, which was created to honor the legacy of Miss Major and J Tool, who were and still are um, instrumental in the queer and trans liberation movements and instrumental in creating. The organizations that were housed at the Miss Major J Tool Building for Social Justice. So just to name those orgs, that was the Audrey Lord Project, Streetwise and Safe, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, Fierce, and Queers for Economic Justice. And at that time, 
you know, because there was a lack of funding for LGBTQ organizing, uh, people of color organizing and youth led organizing, the giving circle was also created to build a collective commitment to the resilience of all the orgs in the building, um, many of which were forced to sort of fight for the similar grants um, and often like, was like destroying collective trust across the organizations. And so we worked collaboratively to, um, to build our collective analysis, to fundraise and to decide where the funding would break down across the organizations. Um, and so I'll just say that this model was super empowering for me because I was funding work that I was a part of and I was a member of um, and two of my political homes, the Audre Lorde Project and Fierce, um, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was sort of, it's honestly why I'm still in philanthropy was that because of that giving circle. Um, and so now as one of the co-directors at the Third Wave Fund, I'm really proud to be a part of an organization that um, houses one of the only sex worker led funds in the US. Um, so the sex worker giving circle is dedicated to resourcing sex workers most impacted by oppression. And through the sex worker giving circle, current and former sex workers most impacted by oppression are empowered to make all grant making decisions, to fundraise and to set philanthropic advocacy priorities. Um, and the sex worker giving circle fellowship ensures that no community is kept out of making decisions um, that impact their lives, right? And so particularly when we know that sex workers receive less than, it's like so many, it's like 0.000063% of philanthropic funding in the US. Um, so yeah, I'm super honored to be on this panel and thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I'm so glad that you sort of lifted up the disparities in funding um, for uh, communities that we care about. And I'm also just pulling on the chat, uh, you know, some of the organizations that you mentioned um, apparently are legends. So, you know, thank you for that work. Um, and uh, so last but not least on this question, wanted to uh, ask Alistair, um, how did you get involved in participatory grant making? Thanks for uh, I think the second time in just a short panel that I'm this last but not least. <laughs> uh, but for me, my entry point into philanthropy and participatory grant making comes as a community organizer in Boston. The group I was volunteering with was funded by Haymarket People's Fund. And so for those who don't know, Haymarket People's Fund supports community organizing groups throughout the New England region. And what really drew me to Haymarket was one, an explicit anti-racist lens to the work. Two was an intentionality around addressing power dynamics and gatekeeper issues within philanthropy. And three, and most importantly for this conversation, was the fact that community organizers were actually entrusted to make the grant making decisions within the philanthropic lens. And so the grant awards from Haymarket were um, not big by any stretch. I think the biggest grant was about $10,000 or so. Uh, but it was clear that grants were more than about money. The whole grant process was actually an opportunity to build community power. And I directly saw the impacts of having perspectives of directly impacted folks in the funding decisions. So there were groups that looked for funding and they had very well-written proposals and had been funded by a number of other progressive funders in the area, but did not end up getting funding from Haymarket People's Fund. So even though the proposals were great, our funding panel members knew who was actually putting boots on the ground and showing up at rallies and actions. Funding for community organizing at this point was still pretty rare. <laughs> so it was important to be able to suss out who was actually doing the real work, which was what Haymarket's process really allowed to do. And so since that entry point in philanthropy, uh, I've been involved with other participatory grant making efforts through funding exchange that Katie mentioned, through Saffron Circle Giving Circle, which Kaberi mentioned, through Access Strategies Funds, New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, and so really I thought all, all grant making was participatory <laughs> and was rudely awakened when that was not the case. <laughs> so fast forward, and this led me to Common Council Foundation based in Oakland. Um, and at Common Council, we house the Native Voices Rising program in partnership with Native Americans in philanthropy. 
and particularly funding Native-led organizing and advocacy efforts. The goal of NVR has really been to re-envision what a philanthropic process can actually look like if it centers, prioritizes, and shifts power to Native people. NVR's model has 25 community reviewers making funding decisions directly impacting Native people across the country. And to put into context why NVR is so important is less than half of 1% of philanthropic dollars still goes to Native com communities. So NBR is trying to change this. We are just finishing up a grant making cycle where we're moving $1.5 million towards Native change. Um, and I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Karan. Thanks so much, Alistair. I was, you brought up so many things for me, including how far we've come as a sector and also how this conversation can be part of us moving forward in terms of being more equitable, uh, equitable, building more community. And so it actually led me to a question I was thinking as you were talking, which is, so now we know we have a lot of experience on this panel and folks at various points and a variety of institutions. And I imagine some people are thinking, so what is the impact of participatory grant making, um, because this is such a, an important word in our field or such an often used word. And also something that people genuinely want to know is like, you know, if I go through this process, sort of what kind of impacts will, uh, will can I can I expect? Can you share with us a little bit about your experience with that? Uh, sure, I can name a few things. First, I'll say uh, I'm from the Bay Area. So the phrase that comes to mind is strength in numbers. <laughs> particularly related to people around the funding table. And so we actually find immense value in having multiple perspectives informing a decision since we all come in with known and unknown biases and blind spots that can actually mitigate, can be mitigated when there are actually more people at the table. And in particular, the folks that have gone through grant processes, usually there are clear yeses, there are clear no's, and actually most of the time is spent on those maybes that exist. And so for groups in the middle, we have found that multiple perspectives can really add depth and nuance into figuring out how do we allocate funds. The second thing that I would say is that the hands do what the heart learns. Uh, so I took that from movement generation for folks who know. And simply put, as grant makers, we practice the unlearned and unconscious habits that have been ingrained over time, whether it's as a grant maker or grant seeker. And more often than not, those are practices that we continue on institutionally. It takes really effort, intentional practice, and repetition to shift towards authentic participation, whether that's in grant making practices or just any or organizational decisions in your organization. And if we continue to base those practices and trusting relationship with the goal of shifting and sharing power, then even if we fail, we're failing forward. And then the third thing that I would say is experimentation, just as a statement, <laughs> because you are relying on the lived experiences and collective wisdom of impacted people. You'll often get very different grants than if you had a paid philanthropic expert making grant decisions behind the curtains. Folks on the ground have deeper knowledge and more context about what the ecosystem looks like and actually needs at any point. And that understanding often allows for bolder grants, which um, many times you would not be able to put forward because they're deemed too risky. And so the last thing I'll say about this is uh, NVR and its participatory practices have really impacted us at Common Council Foundation as we nuance our grant making strategies. Uh, prior to NVR, if you looked at our community organizing grant partners, you would heavily see immigrant rights, worker centers, urban organizing, and NVR's community reviewers and grant partners have really challenged us <laughs> to nuance and expand what does community organizing look like in different communities where we don't have as much history or data, like Native communities, like rural communities, like LGBT communities. So I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Farhan. Thanks, Alistair. And I really appreciate that because one of the things that it, it kind of made me think of was actually there's a way in which this process can take pressure off of the um, program officer or director because, um, you know, so often we're expected to know everything. Um, and, you know, what, what you're speaking to is this ability to tap this 
knowledge and wisdom and this sort of reservoir of resource that's in community. So I really appreciate you for sharing that. Um, Anna, can you tell us a little bit about what you think some of the impacts of participatory grant making are? Absolutely. Um, thank you again for this question. So some of the impacts when I think of participatory grant making are, um, you know, it honestly, it decreases the barriers to individuals who have experiences on an issue area, but who have intentionally or unintentionally been left out of decision making. Just case in point, that's, you know, the heart of it all. Um, I think, so in Third Wave's case, um, you know, current and former sex workers who have never had the seat at a philanthropic table or honestly wanted a seat at how philanthropy is set up right now, um, because philanthropy has historically ignored and undermined and quite frankly, directly fought against the US sex worker led movement. Um, and so the participatory model was like a thousand percent necessary for this fund to work, you know? Um, and because of this, uh, we're able to reach organizations that are doing some of the most critical work, but like Alistair shared, we might not have considered, they might've been considered too risky, uh, given the lack of understanding of those organizations and issue areas in that specific community. Um, I think another thing when I think of impact is, you know, participatory grant making can really build up the scaffolding for sustainable movement driven work um, and growth, as opposed to philanthropy driven growth, right? And that's a really important distinction to make. Um, I just want to say shout out to my co-director, Kiyomi Fujikawa, who talks often about how, um, you know, we, we act as though our grantees are contractors to fulfill our missions of what we think change making looks like. And that is just wild. Like, actually, with participatory grant making, that rightfully flips that on its head, right? We create the space for folks to truly resource the work um, and movements in the ways that they need. It's, it's that simple. Um, and the last thing I'll add is, it's kind of small, but I think it's, it's significant, um, is that uh, something that I know is that's true of queer and trans communities, uh, women of color, BIPOC folks, is that we know how to move money to our people. <laughs> um, something that sometimes falls through the cracks of this, of partic participatory grant making conversations is that literally all of the money going out goes back into community. So I'm talking about the consultants, the caterers, the facilitators, where you rent office space when you can be in person, you know, literally all of it. Um, we found that with participatory grant making, all of those dollars go back in community, not just the grant making dollars. And I, I think this is critical just given, you know, especially given this particular moment where so many of our folks and our community members are in dire need of money and gigs right now. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a ton of ways we can think about the impact of participatory grant making. And I'm so happy that you're actually naming the moment because on top of everything that you said, we know that right now is a very critical time in global and American in history. And so us thinking about different ways that we can be responsive um, and adaptive um, and also continue the legacy of folks who have been doing this work for a long time, um, not only in terms of philanthropy, but really in terms of people who have been having experiences with the issues on the ground. Um, and so I wanted to pass to Kaberi. Can you share some thoughts with us about impact? Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to follow these two because um, I feel like they've named so much of it. But I will say one of the things that I, there are two things I lift up in terms of impact. The first is um, the process itself that allows for the examination and the building of will for the, um, the recommendations to go through. And I'm thinking back to a moment where there was actually a a decision that we were trying to that we were that staff was really excited about and that there was a lot of wariness around whether the board would actually approve that decision and i will say if it had been a regular process in which staff did the analysis and brought the recommendation the um 
the politic of the decision was so challenging that I don't actually think a staff member could, any staff member could have gotten it through. And it was actually the power of the participatory process and the fact that this was coming from community and we had made a commitment to um, following community lead that allowed for that grant to be made. So I think there are times where um, not only is the expertise there, but the power, the, the true collective power of community can come in to actually shift the way in which grant making is made, even if staff is 100% on board. Um, just the power dynamics that often unfold in the boardroom can be um, can be set upside its head um, via a participatory process. I think the other thing that I will lift up in terms of impact is that, you know, at Meyer, one of the things we're really thinking around is how our grant making is really focused on systems level change. And so that the wisdom of the group that is leading to these grant making decisions is actually I, it, theoretically and ideally going to be impacting um, the unjust systems that exist that will improve situations for all. So even as we center um, specific communities and or specific voices, because we're trying to connect our grant making to systems level change, we're thinking about the ways in which the system itself can be challenged and um, subverted or changed um, based upon the wisdom of community. And so I think that's another piece if you're moving beyond um, direct service and really thinking around systems level change that the, um, the nuance and the um, insidiousness of the system can actually be um, shifted with the wisdom of the group. That's amazing, Kaberi. Um, and I just wanted to uh, like reinforce or double check. You're saying that actually participatory grant making can help us get grants approved that we couldn't do on our own. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to make sure I heard that right, because that is uh, you know that puts a smile on my face. Um, because you know we've all been there where we've had a grant we really wanted to make and we fought and we fought and you know maybe it just didn't go through and so. That I think is a really critical piece around impact is that it actually can help us, you know, move stuff out the docket. Um, I love that. So, um, Katie, can you uh, just speak to this impact question? I will be brief because y'all have said all of the things so, so much more beautifully than, than I could. But I do believe it's important to underscore that the impact is both in the outcomes of the grants, which are often different, as Kaberi just said, and in the process itself. And having been involved in so many of these different processes from different vantage points, I feel it's really important to name that several of the, the outcomes and shifting decision-making power from folks who have traditionally held it in institutions that are wealthy and powerful to folks who are impacted by oppression, marginalized in different ways, is a radical act and one that I can't state how important it is enough. So I do like to think about what's in it for the folks who are taking on the work of paid grant makers, often uncompensated, which is wrong, but thinking about the ways that they can benefit from these processes too. It's not about just shifting labor from paid professional staff to folks who are coming in as volunteers. I have seen so many folks benefit from the learning opportunities, from the networking opportunities, from the chance to make those decisions themselves in participating in these. And one of the things I always highlight is that this is such, can be such a joyful experience. I get so much out of working with others. And yes, it's true. I think grants are more effective and more just when they happen this way, but it is such a joyful experience to participate in community in making decisions about money with others. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I love the emphasis not only on outcomes, because we kind of spoke to two sides of this, right? We spoke to the impact side, but we also spoke to the process side and making sure that we're having all of those things valued and, um, and actually how those things are not um, sort of oppositional or, um, you know, segregated, that the process and the outcomes are very interrelated. Uh, um, and so I like that kind of yin and yang approach. So speaking of this, I want to stay with you, Katie. A lot of times we need some low hanging fruit. You know, we need, you know, sometimes, we, you know, we're, we're trying to just, we can't eat, take the whole cake, but we can, you know, we need to nibble our way in. And I'm just wondering uh, if you could, uh, you know, maybe walk us through a little bit about what some of the low hanging fruit 
might be that can come from or is involved with participatory grant making? Well, um, it's great to talk about cake because one of our panelists is a renowned baker, but I do like to think about fruit too because I am living in the Bay Area enjoying all the fruit every day in this fall season on the trees around me. But a few low hanging fruit options for y'all is fund an intermediary. There are several on this call that are doing amazing work, building power, shifting power to communities that are impacted by the decisions our foundations are trying to make. And I mean, our collectively here. I think that's a really easy way to, to do that. And you can learn from that experience. There are many funder collaboratives that are taking this kind of work on. You can also develop a pilot, do something small and intentional and learn from it, over communicate about it with your stakeholders. It's, it's often hard for us to do, but it's so important to share what we're doing, why we're doing it and what we learned along the way. Obviously get input from people who would be impacted by the decisions and pay them for that. I see the, the notes in the chat about how do we compensate folks? It's a really important conversation. And I really want to underscore the critical importance of being guided by values. I love that because that is such a critical piece um, that we're guided by values. And I know look, one of the things I was thinking about as folks were talking is about how far we've come as a sector. And I think a lot of that growth and that innovation has come from uh, letting our, our values be our leading uh, sort of our North Star. So, um, I mean, I could, I, Kabera, you have to go next given the sort of the baking comment because uh, anyone who knows Kabera knows it's like, you know, I always just, I'm just so jealous um, because the, the, the baking is extraordinary. Um, and, you know, uh, tell us, what can we get out of the cake? Well, I agree with this comment. I'm surprised that I'm the baker in this group. This is such a COVID development, but um, um, I really, I do, I love what's being lifted up here. You can't take on the whole cake. And so it is really being able to figure out what the bite size bites are. And so for me, I would say there's a piece around, it doesn't have to be a hard pivot. You're not trying to remake your organization overnight. And in fact, if there's anything that I feel like I've learned, it's that you want to be able to do it with sort of a design thinking lens. You want to be able to learn, iterate, um, build. This isn't about a big splashy show. Um, in fact, if you set yourself up in that type of way, chances are you're going to get it wrong because you're going to be centering yourself and your institution as opposed to centering the work and the people in the community, right? And so um, I think that is one of the biggest pieces is be able to, um, to be able to take out, take on a bite-sized portion, start, develop, learn, talk, um, learn some more, and then be able to also give, give up this sort of like mainstream, um, white supremacy expectations of perfection, right? And so there's a lot of trust that goes into this um, and being able to um, move at the speed of trust, as I said before, I think is really important. I think the other piece of it is really um, being able to over communicate and being transparent before you even get there. So, you know, at Meyer, we haven't put our participatory practices into place yet, um, but we've already started the journey. And so um, our CEO arrived about two and a half years ago. The very first thing she wanted to do in, um, she and I both actually moved from New York to Oregon. Um, and so our first trips out were to First Nations, right? And it was being able to center and make sure that we were going, that we were the ones going and making the trip to meet with these governments, to meet with tribal folk, um, to be able to sit in community, not create an agenda, but actually just create the space for the relationship to begin, um, to be able to do our own homework. So to talk to folks like Alistair or talk to other folks who are doing work that are centering um, Native communities and be able to enter in with a relationship that is not coming from a space of, we're gonna have this metric or this set up by this date, but actually taking the time and space to be able to lay the groundwork and a strong foundation for the work. Um, and that will be a pillar of work that we hope to be able to stand up, co-create with community. And um, we're also, this summer we set up um, Justice Oregon for Black Lives. And as we're identifying a program, op, a program director to lead that work, again, we'll hope to be able to make sure that we are co-creating that entire portfolio with community and exploring how participatory practices can be a piece of that. Um, and then the last thing I will say is that um, there are ways, you know, as, as Anna said at the very beginning, participatory, everything that is labeled participatory is 
may or may not be. And you can start with the baby steps, right? There's a ton within trust-based philanthropy that lays the groundwork that makes it fertile for deeper participatory practices to become true. And so I would say like one of the other pieces is to be really intentional and honest about how far your foundation may be able to go and to make sure that you've laid the groundwork for that. So for us, that also included like getting rid of reports this year and um, being able to um, move to general, op move more of our grantees to general operating support and giving all of them the opportunity to decide if that's what they actually wanted or not. Um, and that's really different at an organization um, that, you know, like where we have 800 million than when we had, we're giving out 2 million a year. So there's a difference in scale that we're also trying to navigate and also being really honest about what that looks like internally for ourselves, um, knowing that the boards, you know, boards may think differently about letting go of approval levels over a $5,000 or a $10,000 grant versus a $300,000 grant. And so um, all of those pieces, I think, is the internal work that needs to be done. Um, and there are ways in which the pilots create safe spaces to be able to still get dollars out the door, still center the community and community voice, but also be able to make sure that you are holding up the mirror to your own institution to build the right practices and the right scaffolding for the work to be authentic and intentional. That's amazing, Kaberi. That that holds up a mirror to so many things that we've been talking about. And I just love how um, you use the framing of don't set yourself up. Um, because I do think that one of the things that happens is we sometimes um, can can set ourselves up in putting all the onus on ourselves and, and entering into community honestly um, and without necessarily expectation, I've found actually um, gives you much better outcomes because people feel they can trust you and they can tell you the truth about what they can deliver on um, and what's what they expect. So we've only got about two minutes left. So I was hoping, Anna, if you could kind of um, just close us out with uh, just a couple thoughts on this low hanging fruit. Yeah, I can. And I, I'm actually going to bring up uh, something that Katie started talking about in the beginning. Honestly, if some of these, what we're sharing are low hanging fruit, um, I've got the apple that just fell from the tree. I caught it. It's right here. And that is intermediaries, y'all. Um, First, I, I will just say everyone should be doing participatory grant making for real, um, period, that's it. But, you know, as Farhan just shared, like, it's possible you haven't built the trust with community yet. It's possible that you have to, yeah, there, there's so many different conversations that have to be had in your institution, like we've been sharing, um, and that process takes a while. So intermediaries, um, by funding intermediaries, that way you can make sure the dollars are still going out in a participatory way and you're able to um, learn from them, grow with them and, and create your own participatory grant making model. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I could shout out a million different intermediaries or community foundations that are doing this work, um, but I know we have just a few minutes left. So yeah, we got this y'all. <laughs> Thanks. And there's a lot of love for your apple in the chat. Uh, prior, there was a lot of love for the horn. And there's definitely been a lot of war, uh, love for uh, Third Wave and many other organizations that are doing this work. Um, so uh, speaking of participatory, we actually want um, to bring everybody into this conversation. You know, uh, we, we have an esteemed panel that have a lot of experience on this, but we know that everybody on this call has a lot of experience. And so we want to have this be a participatory conversation. And one thing that would be helpful to that is uh, for anyone um, in this uh, panel who hasn't named themselves or named themselves completely, that would be useful um, just so, you know, we can know you. I know, you know, NFG is a community. And so, you know, we, we probably love you. Um, and so it'd be great to, you know, to just see who everybody is. Um, um, and now we wanted to move and get a little bit of feedback from the group. And so we're going to, um, you know, shift from our learning from practitioners and really just get a temperature check here. Um, so wanted to ask if folks can put the poll up, um, but you'll see a poll pop up. And we're just going to ask you to take a couple of seconds to assess sort of where you think your organization is around this question of participatory grant making. And I wanna emphasize that this is not a sort of like, 
you better be here, you know, or, you know, this is like, we just want to see where folks are and, and use that as a tool for us to grow. So, you know, we've got three amazing answers uh, to the question of has your institution been able to use participatory grant making? The first is hell yeah. The second is we're interested, but haven't done anything yet. And the third is when hell freezes over. So I'll just, um, I'll just give folks about two minutes to fill out this poll. I think we should have had one response that could have been baby steps. Because after hearing everybody today, I kind of thought need more was like really moving in that way. And now I feel like, okay, we've taken some baby steps. <laughs> so. Well, babies and apples go well together. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there we go. Um, so it looks like we've got a good amount. I'm just going to give about 30 seconds more because we want to um, we want to move toward our breakout groups, which is where we're really going to try to dig in. All right, great. So we're going to um, kind of close up the poll, but it looks like, you know, there's a lot of interest um, and there's also a lot of experience. And so um, now as we break into breakout groups, we'll actually be sort of, you know, sharing some of this stuff of like, how folks have moved, how folks haven't moved, how folks, you know, have moved forward back. You know, we know all this stuff isn't exactly linear either. So um, thanks for participating in the poll. And, you know, now we want to move toward participation. And what we're gonna do is randomly assign everyone in this, uh, in this webinar to a breakout group. Um, and you'll have an assigned facilitator there who's gonna guide you through the next piece. And just to give a little bit of a process orientation, we're going to do breakout groups and then we're going to give folks a 10 minute uh, bio break or, you know, whatever break. Um, and then we'll uh, regroup as a full, um, you know, we'll all come back together, you know, about 25 after the hour. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We hope everyone enjoyed their uh, breakout groups. I enjoyed mine and also the uh, the quick break we had because we know the uh, Zoom fatigue is real. Mm. Um, so as we come back here, we actually wanted to open this section up for sort of questions and a discussion. And the way that we are imagining doing this is that we would like to first encourage folks to turn on their cameras. I'm going to repeat that a couple of times just because I know people are still onboarding, but it really is um, sort of helpful in terms of participation. And that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to encourage folks to turn on their cameras, but please keep yourself on mute because we know there are uh, a variety of things going on um, in, in folks living in workspaces. Um, and then we also want to encourage folks to type your questions in the chat. And we are going to review and reach out to you to see if you're asking, uh, if us having you ask the question on this, um, if you're comfortable with that. So basically, the way it'll work is uh, it's not just put it in the chat. If you put something in the chat, we'll actually, you know, confirm with you uh, if we can have you on video actually ask your questions to the uh, to the panelists. So. Um, so on that provocation, please, everybody, uh, if you can, um, put your video on um, and drop questions in the chat. And uh, if you have, and also if you do drop a question um, and you are comfortable, please note that in your comment that so that we don't have to reach out to you sort of separately. So um, as folks do that, I wanted to start um, with a question that, um, was put in the chat earlier, and I won't disclose who, but someone asked earlier, if anyone could share any tools um, or tips or case stories of entities that may not have been formed as participatory, but were able to transition toward that. And so I wanted to start us off um, with Katie, if maybe you have any, some examples of, or if you know of any examples of folks that really made the transition um, from not doing this at all to actually successfully piloting it. Yeah, well, I bet the audience has some examples to share too. So I welcome your additions. But I think this is one of the most beautiful journeys to be on. And I have seen several foundations try something participatory and go in that direction. A lot of them tend to be community foundations or so-called intermediaries, which I realize is a term that some folks don't really love. 
Um, but I would like to lift up one organization that I know of in, in Europe called Mama Cash, a global feminist funder. They started with a small participatory grant making program in the Netherlands, and then they expanded a participatory grant making program to work with women's funds. And now they're actually transitioning all of their work to be in alignment with their feminist values. So that's just one example. And I know there are others that are exploring this, working on that. How do we engage our board in this conversation, but would welcome additions to, I know there are many others out there. Great, and actually, um, I also wanted to um, see if, uh, Anna, if you had any examples that you wanted to share on this question of folks who moved in that direction. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna be honest with y'all, like not many are coming to mind for me. And I know Alistair, you were just, uh, you just unmuted yourself to say, I mean, I will say for third wave, we didn't start off as uh, having a participatory model. Um, and so we moved into it in 2018. Well, we have other participatory models, but for the sex worker giving circle was in 2018. And so um, just to say that it has been such a great process to move into that and to continue learning from um, that model. But I'd, I'd love to kick it over to you, Alistair, because I know you had one to share. Yeah, I'll just say very briefly, if that's okay, um, like us at Common Council Foundation, we didn't start as participatory grant maker, we started as a philanthropic advisor. And I think I mentioned this in our breakout room, but the, the realization that we were looking for community organizing groups who are in collaboration, collaborative, and really entrusting partnership with one another, it really forced us to look internally <laughs> around like how we're working with these small family foundations or modest family foundations, but we ourselves are not being collaborative in the nature that we're doing our grant making. And so in many ways, like that's how Native Voices Rising came out for us or the Fund for Inclusive California, which is another participatory grant making vehicle that we have, but that's kind of the driver for us to shift from um, holistically kind of being internal and nation building within ourselves into a field of ecosystem building. Great, thanks for sharing that everybody. And now I would um, ask if we can spotlight Shona, Shona Chakravarti with a question. Um, and Shona, when you share, if you uh, feel inclined, feel free to um, direct the question to somebody or it can be for any of the panelists. Uh, yeah, it's really for, for anyone. And I, uh, I had posed this question in my um, breakout group and got some helpful feedback. So it's, um, it's around the, the conflict of interest. Um, you know, we have it for our board members and we are thinking of doing some participatory um, grant making with one of our initiatives. And so wondering, you know, what uh, models or, you know, principles you um, apply. Um, I know there's a range of, you know, some places are like very, you know, you can't even apply. Some places you just recuse yourself, it, it, you know, uh, it, it really varies. So just wondering how you, how you um, tackle this. Thanks. I can share just something briefly. This is a topic I love talking about, and I find that this is one of the things funders identify as a barrier to starting this work. So I think it's really important to get out on the table that, as you said, we always are dealing with conflicts of interest, and we tend to think about this differently as in philanthropy when we're thinking about communities, um, communities taking on decision making. I think the, the conflict of interest frame is important, but I think it can even be reframed. Actually having community members making decisions makes grants better. It's not making grants worse. And obviously we all believe that strongly. And there's one thing in particular I really want to share as a resource with you all, which is the, the conflict of interest policy by the International Trans Fund, which is one of the most beautifully articulated policies and approaches that I've seen out there. Highly recommend you, you check that out because it really does help us navigate what's a traditionally very bureaucratic, legalistic, corporate approach to conflicts of interest. And thinking about what we all know, 
which is that we all have biases, we all have power, we all have privileges that shows up differently in different spaces. And we need to navigate not only confidentiality and conflicts of interest, but also gatekeeping and bias and favoritism. And then there's a lot of specific ways, I think in the grant craft guide, there's even some examples of, of specific policies that you could, you could look at as well. The other thing I would just add is I think when in and particularly for us when folks think they have a conflict of interest they don't have a conflict of interest <laughs> i think folks are often a little bit cautious around a conflict of interest but actually what they perceive as a conflict of interest is actually just more community knowledge around what is happening um, and so it would also push back on folks around or when folks offer up conflicts of interest within our processes we often ask them like what actually is a relationship and is there a conflict of interest? I think there's also a piece around the conversation um, and the decision making. So a lot of times the ability, you, you don't want to, um, well, the challenge is having people not be able to apply because they are the ones who will be doing the work um, because they are represented in the decision making platform. And so I think there's a, you know, I think that's really challenging because you want to be able to have the strongest voices and wisdom around the table, as well as the folks who are the um, most connected to be able to do and, and trusted to do the work. Um, and so I think one of the spaces that has been um, really germane, and I'm looking at Katie Allister and I were on a, <laughs> lived through this in a participatory process ourselves of making sure that folks could participate and be involved in the conversations, but when there were really those like clear conflict of interest spaces of being able to benefit from the grant coming to their institution where would recuse themselves from um, the vote itself. I will also say like, you know, there's power in a lot of different ways. And so part of it is also the strength of the group to hold to those norms. Um, and so that's a lot of the underlying trust building and um, having everyone get on the same page and hold each other to the accountability practices that you've committed to as a group. Great. So um, I wanna ask a question that I'm not gonna attribute, um, but again, feel free folks to let us know if you are comfortable um, with, um, you know, kind of asking your question. Uh, wondering what folks uh, are wrestling or grappling with in order to incorporate and learn from the mistakes that uh, they've made while entering into participatory grant making. So that's really for any of our panelists. Because, and again, I just want to emphasize that this is a journey. Um, and, you know, in non participatory grant making, we make mistakes. So, you know, the assumption that we have to get everything right every time is actually um, excludes a lot of the reality of what happens anyway. So just wondering if anybody would like to share some of their challenges with that. I'll be honest because we, are, we just went through our grant making process for NVR. There were some groups that we decided not to fund where <laughs> if I had my druthers <laughs> would love us to fund it, but I know that my role as uh, as staff member is just to administer the process and not have any <laughs> decision making input. And so that's actually just like a personal struggle within participatory grant making, but trying to step into the knowledge of the group. <laughs> Yeah, I think one challenge that comes up for me in the work that we're doing at Third Wave is um, we, it, you know, we had a shift from having very in-person and pretty intimate, like, conversations and community building in, you know, in an office space, um, which allowed for folks to fully participate, particularly thinking about um, a lot of our fellows don't necessarily have access to cell phones or computers or internet and that sort of thing. So it made it really difficult to actually do the work in the ways that we had hoped. Um, and we had, we made some workarounds and actually it made it really powerful that we could then by shifting to virtual, we were able to like invite folks from across the country, but like um, otherwise like that, that shift is really, that was a really difficult challenge to navigate. And I'm sure other folks doing this work navigated that too. 
I think one of the things I might add, um, especially when the grants are small, is what is the concept of the of the net grant? And so what is the process that um, folks go through in um, connecting with community or doing the site visits and having that be proportional to the amount of dollars that are going out. And I think this is entering in, uh, you know, like I shared at the beginning, my entry into all of this was through giving circles. And there was a high level of discomfort for me knowing that, you know, with my professional hat on, I might spend X amount of time with an organization and they could get a five digit grant. Um, and for 10 times the amount of time and effort they might get a very a much smaller grant from a giving circle or through a process and so i've always sort of struggled with that piece of it so i just think we yes you want it to be um an important process that is empowering for the folks who are learning through that process but also keeping it um right sized for the proportional amount that you're giving which can seem really um which is different right like if you're in that grant grantee seat of like all of the effort that you might go through to get two thousand dollars versus all of the effort you might go through to get twenty five thousand um, dollars and it isn't always proportional when it comes to um, participatory practices i think the other piece is um when you are when there's a fund fundraising component to it um being really honest about where the control and the power is so like staff can still hold power um and there are ways in which um, all of these processes can be formed and framed to still be able to um, put the guardrails tight so that you are leading people to the decisions that you want or that someone might want. And so I think it's just really, it's, it, it, it's our own integrity in if we are in roles that are creating these participatory spaces to be really honest about um, what's on the table and what's not. Um, and, and that I think is, I think that's one of the inherent challenges to it. Um, and I've seen, you know, I've had a lot of difficult conversations around that piece of like how much control and um, power are we actually giving up and sharing or how much of this is, you know, really good optics, but not necessarily transformational in a really authentic way. Great. So I just wanted to see, um, Katie, if you could chime in on this. And then after that, we're going to go to uh, Becca with a uh, question. Those are such wonderful examples. And I, I just like to go back to remembering and reminding myself the first grant I ever made was a, a failed grant. The organization closed, I think, weeks after I made the grant. And that was in a traditional model. So I've really learned a lot about risk. But the offering I'd like to, or the learning that's really stuck with me recently has been the difference in, in how you actually select folks to, um, to join these. And who is deciding who decides is a whole separate conversation. But at Wikipedia, when we were starting some of these programs, we actually started with an open call, just putting it out there to the world. Anyone can join. This is what we're looking for. These are the expectations. And who did we get? We got a lot of folks who were actually from, who were cis men, who were from the US and Western Europe, and who had a lot of extra time to give. So we realized that having an open call while we were eliminating some potential for gatekeeping was not actually getting the folks that we really wanted to participate because Wikipedia has to represent a lot more than white cisgendered men from the US and, and Western Europe. So actually in moving to different models and kind of recruiting, selecting and working with partners to select, working through partners to select folks is a really important learning that I actually think leads to the next question. <laughs> Yeah, so Becca, um, would you uh, like to ask your question? Yeah, I mean, that was essentially my question is like, um, and it seems like everybody kind of approaches this this question, uh, you know, in their own unique way, as, as is true with every foundation for everything we do. But uh, I did want to, that was my question is like, how, how are people recruiting um, and then choosing the, the committee members and also um, further like how much training and orientation is involved then in developing that committee to to become effective grant makers. Does anyone want to just add on to that? Because I know we touched, you know, th this was a back and forth. So we touched on it a good amount, but I was intrigued by Katie, what you shared. Um, and actually, it looks like, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to not mispronounce your name, um, Inosukli. Uh, I'm really sorry, because I'm sure uh, I'm mispronouncing it. And I, people do that to me all the time. Are, are you trying to jump in with uh, yeah, comments? I was. I have, I, I, 
um, I guess the question someone made is that uh, this idea of transforming philanthropy. And um, it seems that participatory grant making is, is not the end goal, but it's part of a, a longer term goal of transforming philanthropy. And because at some point we get to this point, we, we get to this thing, I'm, I, I don't know, I hear it just, it, I don't know, I can't, I can't express it well enough, but my question is therefore, um, what is the longer term goal and or I'm curious about, is there like a group of funders or maybe this is NFG, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my first call. Is this a place that does, that's trying to do that? And some of it's community funds and maybe you're creating people's funds. You know, that's what it seems like. Cause I don't think it's just training. Well, sorry, I don't mean to, yeah. Um, but if that's the case, is it also, is there, are there institutions like Ford and others that are also following this, this, this belief? I'm just curious about the landscape. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, and I just would say uh, before panel response, this is a conversation. So at this point, you know, anybody feel free to sort of join. We'd appreciate a heads up in the chat so we can keep it orderly. But if you have something to share, it does, you know, we're not only sort of asking for questions, but also, you know, contributions. So, but panelists, do you have any, any uh, response to that? Yeah, just, just to say, I think this is so important. Participatory grant making is great. Obviously, we love it, but it exists in a system that is deeply, deeply problematic. And so for me personally, participatory grant making is just in the system we have now within capitalism. This is important. We shift power through shifting money. We shift power through shifting decisions about money. But that is not the long term goal for me. And I think that probably echoes what a lot of the, my fellow panelists think, too. And in terms of the institutions, yes, it is much more common to find in public so-called intermediary foundations, community foundations, et cetera. But there's a lot of interest in private philanthropy as well. And this is something that many of us are deeply passionate about where there is historically less oversight, less accountability, less transparency. And institutions themselves are feeling the push from the critiques but also the pull from the innovation and the possibilities of participation in philanthropy. So there are the Fords of the world, there are the open societies that are trying this out, but many private institutions are trying this out through collaboratives or within small, um, small pilots, like Hewlett has tried out a, a pilot, and I know there are several other funders that are private institutions that are testing it out as well. Wonderful. And I just wanted to note that um, just, you know, since somebody mentioned this, that yes, NFG is one place that, um, you know, is supporting this shift to um, participatory grant making and, you know, is sort of trying to build a community of community, if that makes sense, a community where what we do is build community. And so um, just would encourage folks to um, explore that in our various programs. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we were moving toward a stack, which I believe starts with Mary Sebecki. Hello there. I wanted to respond to the woman who spoke right before Katie, the first time caller. Are you still there, caller? Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the end game? Again, I think that really gets at the heart of what this session is all about. The recognition of that we are operating in a system ostensibly designed to do good, but that we're not always modeling the behaviors that we want to see in the world. Yeah. Um, and so I think there is dawning recognition or enlightenment among us. Um, probably some of the most enlightened folks you'll find around these issues are the folks who are in NFG. Um, but I think it's it's about relationships with grantees that as we're talking about today or engaging civic participants in our grant making, all of those things. Um, but I think, you know, <laughs> someone once said to me, you know, when we all struggle about IRS regs and this and that, a wise person once said to me, you know what, they're never gonna come after the people with money. And in some ways we are so insulated because of the field we're in. Um, compared to some of our grantees and people out there doing the work. But I think we really need to examine ourselves and the links we have um, to some of the systems in our country 
that are not benefiting everybody. And so for me, that's the long game. I mean, I even want to go deep in terms of looking at investments. I mean, we've talked about socially responsible investments and all of those things, and I'm sure many participants on these calls, and maybe this can be a future session for NFG. For on, I'd be happy to organize it with you, but even moving beyond the current screens and this and that. I mean, really unpacking, you know, we use 5% or some more, we apply at least in private foundation, 5% of our, you know, corpus each year to grant making. 95% of it sits there. What is that 95% doing? Um, so again, there's lots of questions, but I think it really is just encouraging the field to start taking a closer look at all of its practices, starting with grant making, because that's an easier, you know, apple, to go back to that metaphor, it's an easier, you know, it's the low lying fruit. But I think there are bigger pictures and bigger questions that we ask ourselves. And again, I'm getting old. I'm going to retire soon. Y'all take it up and good luck to you. And if there's anything I could do to help you, let me know. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Alistair, you were next in the stack. Yeah, I'll just echo a lot of what Mary said. I think grant making, participatory grant making in particular, is just the, the very end outflow of what a grant making process and what philanthropy exists to be. And so there, there's the investment side, there's the operations side, there's a lot of pieces where the systems were set up essentially to model capitalism. And what does that look like to actually shift into something where the end beneficiaries are not the folks who are um, the trustees of the foundation, but are actually folks in community that are being impacted by these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's kind of the, the, the thought process that we kind of come through. Um, and I'll also say just, uh, yeah, I think that the piece around what Katie mentioned just really quickly um, is that we're in the midst of this immense generational wealth transfer that's happening. I think it's like $30 trillion or so. And so there's new institutions that are being built up. And because of the models of philanthropy, a lot of those are anonymously set up as donor advised funds or there's a lack of transparency around all of this. And so actually I, I say all that because I think participatory grant making is actually a really big and not necessarily a fringy idea, but it's just the systems that are built up don't allow those uh, outcomes and impacts to be modeled out and amplified to folks. Wonderful. And so I am gonna take facilitators privilege and ask the last question. And um, because to me, it's actually the elephant in the room and it's related to the fact that we're all, you know, having this conversation virtually. So I guess it's actually the elephant in the Zoom, um, which is how has COVID, I know I had this sneak, you know, just, you gotta do it sometimes, but it's really uh, this question of um, COVID, right? And, you know, COVID has disrupted so many of our systems and the ways that we kind of do our work. Um, and I'm just wondering how we might think about participatory grant making in the COVID context. Um, yeah, I know, cause I know a lot of times participatory grant makers in person, you know, the recruitment, all of these things. So wondering if anybody has any thoughts on that. Ooh, 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 can I go? Sure. Um, you know, for me, and maybe I'm an outlier here, but in some ways, the advent of COVID has opened things up for us a bit. It's possible now to bring our board members at, right into the rooms of our grantees on a more frequent basis. It can bring, uh, the reverse can be true. It can bring our grantees into our boardrooms. It can bring the other folks that we want to engage into our boardrooms. So um, again, I think in some ways, and I love seeing the babies in the picture. I think there was someone earlier with a baby. I mean, it's humanizing us. And I think that can only be for the good. So who knew the technology could humanize us in some way, but um, yeah, I think it does provide some access that we didn't have before. Can we um, go, uh, get Doreen? I hope uh, I'm not mispronouncing that. You wanted to comment? Yes, you've done an excellent job pronouncing my name. <laughs> um, I am a change maker. Uh, I sit on a um, 
Community Connections, which is an organization that is a broker between the foundations and the grassroots. And what we've done is we've gone virtually and we created what we call a rapid response. We have a lot of um, grassroots organizations that need to be able to transition during COVID. And so our rapid response addresses those needs for them. Um, we also meet the need of the foundations because oftentimes you all have priority issues that you are trying to get to the grassroots. And so in, in the way our organization is structured, we meet those needs for the foundation by getting the funds to the individuals on the grassroots level that are doing those um, projects. Thank you so much. So now we're gonna uh, move toward closing and I wanna pass to Kaberi um, to just kind of give us some closing thoughts. Absolutely. So happy to share this space with Katie as we bring us to a close. Um, you know, clearly the conversation in the breakout rooms and in the group, um, the question and answer shows that there's a lot of energy and excitement around this. So that is um, filling my heart with joy and just bringing a big smile to my face. As you can tell from our conversations and experience with it, you know, we really believe um, that PG is a way to bring about a more equitable, transparent, an accountable kind of philanthropy that is more just and more effective. Um, and so one of the most piece, important pieces of it for us is that it's shifting power from those who have had it to those who have not historically been at the table. And that shift is such an important piece of it in and of itself. And the beginning, hopefully, of much bigger shifts um, of how philanthropy as a sector can show up and be transformed. Katie. Thank you, Kavit. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I've been dropping articles and resources into the chat. Many of you have as well. There's so much. If you Google this topic, lots, comes, lots will come up. But a few quick things I do want to share is, of course, the grant craft guide, Deciding Together about participatory grant making. It doesn't get easier to say that word for me, even though I've probably said it a million times, <laughs> but we have that guide with mechanics and tools. And then there's a, there's a lot of articles as well, one by the Ford Foundation called Participatory Grant Making, Has Its Time Come? And then a few articles I'll, are, I, I will drop in the chat, but I wanted to give a shout out to a community of practice that you're welcome to join. You can reach out to me to uh, be connected to that group. We meet once a month. We just love talking about this stuff. We love the questions that you asked. And there's a mentorship program that we're running through that as well. Just a really fun way to get involved is through that community of practice of nerds like me who love talking about this stuff. And then the last very practical tool I'll offer will be one of my favorite uh, guidebooks to participation, which is called the Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making, and is a great guide for understanding the difference between meaningful consultation, co-decision making, and then just asking for someone's input. So that guide has a lot of tips and tricks. And with that, I want to thank my fellow panelists for offering so much insight and as well the audience. You all have a lot of expertise in this area, too. We know that we can make more change better and together. So thank you. Back to you, Farhan. Yes, and I just wanted to thank our fabulous panel. It's been a real pleasure learning from all of you, especially given the diversity of experience and background. Um, and so I wanted to thank everybody um, for participating in this um, in this panel, which is part of NFG's 2020 virtual conference series. I just dropped a link into the chat. And so please look out for the rest of our um, events that'll be happening throughout December. And so thanks again. We really appreciate y'all and we look forward to continuing to build community. Have a good day. Thank you.